Welcome to Health Talk by Flowly. We begin every episode with a brief exercise to shift your nervous system closer to flow state. We do this so your nervous system can settle and you'll feel relaxed and ready to experience the interviews in each episode. Julian, who is the voice of our Flowly experiences, will take a few seconds to lead this exercise. Take a moment to adjust yourself into a comfortable position. Take a slow breath in through your nose, hold it for a few seconds, and slowly exhale through your nose as well. In your next breath, breathe in for a count of five. One, two, three, four, five. And now exhale for a count of five. One, two, three, four, five. Continue to take slow breaths in through your nose and out through your nose as well. Counting in five and counting out five. We have you breathe in this pattern because it equals six breaths per minute which is the average breathing rate at which people can best control their nervous system. In Flowly, we do individualized calibration to find the exact breathing rate healthiest for you because it varies from person to person. For today, we'll end this exercise with one more five count in, one, two, three, four, five, and a five count out, one, two, three, four, Five. Let's begin today's health talk. Hey y'all, my name is Celine and I'm the founder of Flowly and your host today for Health Talk by Flowly. As some of you might know, Flowly is a mobile platform for chronic pain and anxiety and we use biofeedback to help you train your relaxation system, your nervous system, and really help you manage all the symptoms around it. In our health talk, we talk to chronic pain patients, advocates, mental health warriors, as well as professionals in the industry and space um, to really learn from their expertise. Today's guest is someone our whole team has looked to for guidance because he's such a foremost expert in the biofeedback space. And we have Dr. Richard Gewertz. He's a distinguished professor of psychology for the California School of Professional Psychology at Alliant International University. He's been doing psychophysiology and biofeedback research and clinical work for the last 30 years. Dr. Gewertz was also the former president for the Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback. His primary research focus is in understanding the physiological and psychological mediators involved in conditions, such as chronic pain, fibromyalgia, gastrointestinal pain. And Dr. Gervers has studied applications of heart rate variability, biofeedback for pain and anxiety, and cardiac rehabilitation, just to name a few. So welcome to Health Talk, Richard. Thank you. Good to be here. So I wanted to jump into the interview first by asking you, what is biofeedback? Because I think some of our community members know it, but many people have never had contact with biofeedback. So what is it? So biofeedback is a a field that started about uh, 45 years ago when we started getting a good enough technology to um, measure physiology in a way that we could show it to the uh, subject or client. Um, and so biofeedback predicated on the, on the um, plasticity of the nervous system was thought that if somebody could see what their physiology was doing, maybe they could change it. And little by little, we've understood the field better and better as time has gone on. We started off with very crude measurements, finger temperature, muscle tension, uh, just basic heart rate. But as technology has gotten better, we've been able to measure more and more things about physiology and feed them back, including EEG feedback, heart rate feedback, or reliability feedback, uh, as well as uh, the, the traditional ones like skin conductance and temperature. So it's a field that is growing uh, steadily. Um, it, it has the disadvantage of being in the space between traditional science and alternative medicine. NIH considers us alternative medicine, and when we apply for it, they say, no, no, 
it's established science. There shouldn't be an alternative medicine. So it little by little, it's kind of finding its own niche in that space. But it has grown steadily over those many years. What does biofeedback actually look like? Like, let's say today someone wants to try traditional biofeedback. Um, where do they go? And what does a session actually, what does it look like? Well, there's a, there's a certification institute called Biofeedback Certification International Association, BCIA. And they uh, certify uh, the expertise of practitioners. Um, and so it, it would vary depending on what the problem was, but if they, they would go to a practitioner who has equipment that they would put finger, finger leads on, ECG leads, maybe EEG leads on, um, other kinds of things like that. And then after an assessment, the person would look at a screen and they would see some aspect of the physiology that, they're, that the clinician is trying to get them to change. And then they would work on that using relaxation, breathing, uh, or just straight um, mental techniques to try and change these things. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would vary tremendously. It might be an athlete trying to, um, you know, pro golfer trying to be able to make golf foot putts. He has to learn a very specific skill to do that. It could be someone who's depressed who has to learn to kind of change their whole physiology together with their mental uh, techniques. Or it could be uh, physical disorders like um, irritable, irritable bowel syndrome, where they want to change their physiology to be able to alleviate the symptoms. So most practitioners use some combination of some psychological techniques as well as the biofeedback, but some only use biofeedback. There's a whole series of techniques called neurofeedback that uses EEG, electroencephalogram feedback, which takes many, many sessions, but it's, a, it's an up and coming area. Not as much good solid data yet as there are in the other areas, but certainly of great interest for many people. Yeah, so you mentioned there's a lot of different types of leads and uh, data you can get from biofeedback. I know that for us at Flowly, we focus on making heart rate variability biofeedback uh, most accessible because it's also a great entry point, I think, for people that have no access or um, experience with biofeedback. So I'd love to get your take on um, explaining what is heart rate variability and what is HRV biofeedback because it's, it's an education process for us to try and share, you know, what are the benefits and what does HRV biofeedback actually do for you? Okay, so first, HRV is separate from the biofeedback. Biofeedback mm -hmm. is an intervention technique. HRV has been around for a while, and it refers to the differences in beat-to-beat -beat heart rate. Um, so basically, when most of us are familiar with heart rate from the gym, where we just measure our average heart rate or from a watch. But if you measure beat by beat, one R wave to the next to the next, those distances between those R waves do differ in healthy individuals. And strangely, the more they differ, the better, the more healthy they are. The opposite of what mostly would think. We think variability would be bad, but here variability is good. The reason for that is that the variability is being controlled by a branch of the nervous system called the autonomic nervous system. It has two branches, the sympathetic, which is the fight, flight, fright, and the parasympathetic, which is the rest, digest, restore branch. They're like accelerators and brakes. The sympathetic is like an accelerator, the parasympathetic is like a brake. And they work together, mostly reciprocally, not always reciprocally, to kind of manage uh, both the environment, your internal environment of your body, making adjustments for changes in blood pressure or blood flow, but they also in, in adjustment to external stimuli. So when you're faced with a very large threat, the brake goes off, the parasympathetic goes off, and the sympathetic goes on, and that everyone's sort of familiar with the fight flight response that you get in a real major emergency. So most people could kind of think about it if you're riding on the freeway and uh, suddenly the traffic stops and you slam on the brakes and miss the car in front of you by two inches. What's your physiological reaction? And a few seconds later after that, you get butterflies in your stomach, you get sweaty, your hands get colder, your heart rate speeds up like tremendously. Everybody kind of knows what that fight flight response is. That only really applies during major threats. For the most 
hard, most of the day, our heart rate variability is controlled by the breaking of the parasympathetic, which is making adjustments for blood pressure and in, in uh, thinking processes and things going on. So that's where the measurement of that comes from. And it, it, it became important because it's really the only way we can measure the parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic, we can measure, we've been able to measure for a long time, like, like palm or sweating, mm. like putting electrodes on the palm. And right. when you get a sympathetic reaction, you, your palm sweat, and it, it shows up on a, on a scale, which is a pretty simple kind of feedback. But, uh, the, but the parasympathetic was much more elusive until we had technology that allowed us to look at beat by beat changes in heart rate. And what we know is that the beat by beat changes are dominated by one rhythm specifically uh, that comes from breathing. And that is when you breathe in, the brake goes off. And when you breathe out, the brake goes on. So it makes sense to think about it. When you're breathing in, oxygen is present in the alveoli. So you'd want your heart rate to be a little faster to take advantage of the oxygen. But then when you breathe out, there's no oxygen there. So the brake slows the heart down and gives you a rest. And over a lifetime, it saves you like 450 million heartbeats because of that rhythm. And that rhythm is the major draw, the major drive of heart rate variability, but not the only one, but the major one. Once we were able to measure that, we started studying uh, swamis and gurus and Tibetan monks and asked them to do what they do when they get centered and calm. And what we found that they all do is they breathe at a very slow, specific rate, somewhere between four and a half and seven breaths a minute. And their physiology is remarkable when they do that. Mm -hmm. And we little by little came to understand why that physiology works that way. It's because they're using all the different rhythms in their body are lining up becoming in a, in a very um, specific, coherent fashion so that they line up so, they, so the, the rises and falls and heart rate become exaggerated during this slow, what we call resonance frequency breathing. And that's what the biofeedback is. Once we kind of realized that the swamis were using it, we just sort of modernized it for the uh, Western market. And it's basically kind of high tech, specific kind of meditation that comes from this kind of slow breathing. With the technology though, we can find that resonance frequency very easily now. And uh, as your product is doing, and once we find that and people practice that on a regular basis, we get some of the same benefits that the swamis got, or the gurus got, which is very good blood pressure regulation, very good anxiety regulation, very good emotion regulation, and these are things that come with that kind of thing. That's why we always say it's a brand new idea. It's been it's 2,500 years old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And I remember that really struck me when we first talked and when I was first learning about biofeedback or even the HRV itself and resonant frequency was that it's been used for thousands of years, um, but only now are we figuring out how to make it more accessible to everybody. Um, and one of the things I think also fascinated me about your work is that you work from, you work with everyone from like chronic pain patients, chronic Ill, illness patients, kids to high performance athletes. Um, and I think, you know, most of our population comes from the chronic health, chronic illness space, but they might be curious about how does biofeedback help athletes? Um, and, you know, what are some of your experience around that? Yeah, well, uh, the, the most, the most uh, convincing application is with athletes in set situations like uh, putting in golf, hitting in baseball, uh, a gymnastic, a short gymnastic routine, uh, diving, um, where you're pre, the pre-anxiety going into the activity really does determine how well you're going to do. Now, as your anxiety levels go up, your muscles become less fluid in their motion. They don't move as smoothly. Uh, you're not in as good a control of your autonomic nervous system as you want it to be in the optimal range. So anything that has that strong emotional component to it is really helped by learning mm. how to speak and doing it. One of the, 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 the most fun group I work with are rhythmic gymnastics. These are adorable little Asian kids mostly who uh, and their coaches are 
uh, Russians and Bulgarians who are very, very tough. And so these kids, and I don't, if you know that sport, it's the one with the hoops and the uh, ball. And it's right, a lot of tumbling, dancing. Yeah. yeah, tumbling and dancing to music with apparatus. And you can imagine how stressful it would be. You're throwing a ball way up in the air, catching on your neck, doing a flip. So these little kids, um, they're you know they're like eight to twelve year olds mostly, get stressed before they go on. And that little bit of stress makes a big difference in their performance at that elite level. I'm talking about kids in the top 50 in the, in the, in the country. Right. So when we, taught them the, when we taught them the technique, we just teach them how to do the biofeedback just before they go on. And they get their autonomic nervous system into that optimal flow, and they definitely improve their performance. Wow. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah, and for those who don't, Richard, you're based in San Diego, which is a big golfing epicenter. So I'm sure you get a lot of golfers working with you. Yeah, we get some of those. And uh, it turns out that on our campus, there's a gym that they run out to the rhythmic gymnast kids. So all of them in San Diego come, it's right across the street from our office. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I've pretty much seen all of those kids. And they're, it's real fun to work with because they're all adorable kids. <laughs> You were talking about the heart rate variability um, and then, you know, how you integrate it into like a biofeedback practice. Uh, maybe for some people, it'd be helpful to understand what is the actual uh, correlation between practicing that type of biofeedback with helping pain um, or helping anxiety relief? So it depends on the disorder. Um, so uh, the, the, it turns out that when people breathe at that resonance frequency, it has several effects on the body. One of them is that it changes a reflex in the body, the reflex between blood pressure and heart rate, called the barrel reflex. And we've had good studies to show that when people practice regularly, they actually change this reflex, which was never thought to be uh, changeable. It was thought to be an immutable reflex. Hmm. Now we know that there's enough neuroplasticity in the body that it can be changed with practice on a daily basis. And again, that's why it's been around for many, many years. Um, so that's one function. But we also know, we think that the breathing at this frequency has it seems to bombard the brain through a pathway called the vagal afferent pathway. And some people may have heard about vagal nerve stimulators which stimulate this pathway externally. So that pathway is a powerful pathway into the brain. It tells the brain everything going on in the body. Otherwise, the brain wouldn't know what's going on, how to regulate it. And it looks like that pathway is greatly stimulated by this technique as well. So for pain and anxiety and depression, for those patients we see with those, we, we have to try to fit it into what we think is going on. For, for the depression, it looks like this technique actually directly stimulates the vagal afferent pathway in a way similar to electronic stimulation. And that seems to have antidepressive effects on the brain. <clears throat> mm. Almost a direct biofeedback technique on the brain without, we usually combine it with, with talk therapies, but which, is, which you should do. But even without it, it seems to have some impact. Um, for other kinds of things for, for pain, um, it depends on the nature of the pain, but the most common pain is uh, chronic muscle pain, like low back pain, attention headache, um, neck pain, arm pain. Uh, what we've worked out is that there's a mechanism that uh, little nodules in the muscle called trigger points are affected by the sympathetic nervous system, by that accelerator. And what we pretty sure happens is with practice, the parasympathetic break governs that sympathetic input into these trigger points. So that when that pain is released in the trigger point, it stays released when you practice this biofeedback technique. And we've done a lot of work on that uh, for that kind of pain. For other kinds of chronic pain, it's not as dramatically effective, but the pathways that the, the brain um, processes pain are affected by this biofeedback as well. So people with like nerve pain or other kinds of pain that um, can modify that pain processing um, by having the brain kind of process it differently using this technique. Right. Uh, and that's sort of the, the range of things going on with, with those kinds of problems. 
Yeah. And, and we've also found like when we did case studies and we're in the middle of clinical trials now that uh, doing the sessions themselves often are helpful for relaxing, uh, feeling a little less pain or less anxious, feeling more relaxed. Uh, but we were just talking about you, me, and my co-founder, Julian, before this interview started that consistency in practice is also very key for biofeedback. Um, and the way that our team talks about it is kind of like, you know, you got to go to the gym to work out your muscles. Is that kind of how you think about it? Or, you know, why is it so important that practice is part of your biofeedback? Yeah. So if you're trying to build up muscle strength, <clears throat> you can't just go to the gym once. You've got to go on a regular basis and keep on going if you want to maintain that muscle strength. So this is the same thing. Uh, and that's why probably meditation techniques have been daily for thousands of years, right? It, it's not a one-time thing. Yep. So it looks like people need to practice to keep this reflex changes going that we're doing. They need to practice reasonably regularly. I mean, I don't think you have to be a fanatic about it, but when people practice pretty regularly, they seem to do it. The other thing is when you practice regularly, you overlearn the technique. So when you need it, you can use it very quickly. So even yeah. without the biofeedback, we find like our, our gymnastic girls, they're not allowed to use biofeedback in their gym when, when they're performing, but they've learned this technique so well in practice that they can implement it immediately without actually having feedback right then and there. So there's a couple reasons why it's important to practice on a regular basis. Yeah. And what do you recommend? Like daily, few mi uh, 10 minutes a day, something like that? Let's say minimum 10 minutes a day. We would prefer 20 minutes, but we know most people's lives don't allow for 20 minutes. <laughs> right. Well, nowadays with the pandemic, probably people have nothing else to do. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like 10 minutes is kind of doable for most people. Yeah. Um, and, if they're really, and if they're really serious about it, 20 minutes a day seems to be good. And more is better. The, these, the uh, gurus that we studied in India do it all day long and they have mm -hmm. remarkable physiology. I mean, but yeah. most of us aren't going to do that. Uh, but I mean, when you think about squeezing in 10 minutes a day, that's pretty easy to think about 20 minutes, a little harder, but some people do that very nicely. So that's what we, that's what we think. We've actually found a lot of our users will do it like 10 minutes in the morning and then 10 minutes at night. So they break it up so that it's easier for them. That's great. Um, yeah. For some, for some people, it's a very good sleep inducer. Right. So it, not for everybody, but for some people. So uh, we, we've worked on studies with insomnia. And we combine it with uh, a CBT kind of in, in interventions with insomnia. It seems to really help, uh, help people go to sleep and stay asleep. I want to ask, how did you begin your work in this space? Like it's not, it's, you know, it's really been picking up steam over the past, I don't know, few decades, but how did you even start? Well, I was lucky enough to be a student of one of the one of the um, giants of the field of psychophysiology, the measurement of psychological factors on physical physio physiology, named Dr. Peter Lang, still going strong in his 90s down in Florida. Uh, and so he, uh, I, I was a student at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and he offered an advanced class that he led me into called Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The subtitle, it's like something or other, blood, sweat, and tears. And he was a very, he's a brilliant, brilliant guy. And it was a very inspiring course. So it just inspired me to really try to understand this mind-body. I was always interested in mind-body connection. I thought that was mm -hmm. an interesting phenomena. Um, and so at the time, we had some technology, and I did some research with him on that. But as the technology grew, it got more and more possible to study this. And then we realized there were some applications of this in, in the beginning of the field of biofeedback. So I was dabbling in biofeedback while being an, a, a faculty member and then realized that this was really a powerful technique. So I started doing um, part-time clinical work together with my academic work and then began to develop a whole pattern of research. Um, at the same time, I had a colleague in the field named Dr. Paul Lehrer out in Rutgers, who was also doing similar kinds of things, mostly focusing on asthma. And we were good friends and great colleagues. And so we kind of began to figure this out together in this heart rate variability about 15, 18 years ago. We didn't really know what we were doing, but we figured it out little by little. 
with the help of a brilliant Russian scientist named Evgeny Vashilo, yeah. who was the uh, cosmonaut physiologist in Russia before he came here. And so the great story he tells is <clears throat> they were watching the heart rates of their cosmonauts in space. And one of the guys every day for about 15, 20 minutes would show these heart rate patterns that were really dramatic rises and falls. And they thought it was space sickness. They thought it was a problem. So he calls up and says, Yuri, what's going on? He says, leave me alone. I'm meditating. Oh. <laughs> turns out that one of those cosmonauts was a breath meditator and was producing these patterns. And so uh, Evgeny, brilliant, he was an engineer, physiologist, figured it out, what the physiology was and really helped us understand it. <clears throat> and uh, he's now in the States and doing remarkable stuff also at Rutgers now. Wow, that's a really cool story. Um, it also <laughs> kind of leads into my next question because your work is inevitably tied to technology. And as it develops, it, I, I feel it must change your work in some way. So how has you know the developing tech changed how you've thought about the space or your research in recent years? So when I started in 1965, um, uh, we needed a, a good sized room and an electrical engineer to measure heart rate. Yeah. And now we're doing it with our watches, right? So, yeah. Um, so as the technology improved in terms of measurement of all the, all the phenomena, uh, EMG, that lets electromyographics, muscles, that's a fairly technical tech, uh, you need fairly good equipment with noise cancellation to be able to do that. That's gotten so much better. Brainwave technology is so much better. Heart rate technology that finally allows us to look at beat by beat changes in heart rate. And that's what allowed this whole field of HRV to occur. Without that, we yeah. wouldn't have that. So all the technology plus the software to analyze it um, has really been um, fantastic. And now we're on the verge of wearable technology that is going to give us all this stuff in very, hopefully, in fairly cheap wearable techniques. Uh, right now, we're waiting for the price to come down and the wearables enough for the they, to scale it up to the population. But that's going to really change things when we have big open scale uh, we're talking to big insurance companies who are looking to scale it up to big numbers of their patients. They've done that in some places in Finland. They did that with right, almost every um, Finnish university student has some kind of a technique to do this. That's very cool. Yeah, so we're totally we're totally dependent on technology. It's yeah, really made all the difference in the world. I wonder if that's a factor in this next question because we asked our Flowly community if they had any questions for you. And this question that came up a few times is um, some of our users have done biofeedback like in the 70s, 80s, um, or even in recent years. But as you know, biofeedback is not totally accessible to many people. Um, for people living in more rural areas or not big cities, it might be hard to even find a clinic or specialist that can do it. Um, and so one of the questions was, you know, if biofeedback has been studied and clinically validated for, you know, many applications, why do you think it hasn't taken off in the mainstream? Or, you know, why haven't more people heard about it? Do you think it's something to do with like the tech or the accessibility, things like that? Um, generally, it's been psychologists who have been the practitioners, but psychologists are not known for their high tech ability. And so, you know, they, it's been comfortable for them to do talk therapies and adding biofeedback would be, it, it's a push. Some of them, more and more of them are doing it. Like it's taken a bit of convincing to get people to learn a whole new skill set. Same for physical yeah. therapists or other, tech, other technology or other professions. So that's one reason. The other reason you mentioned is the cost. And uh, accessibility, because, you know, in, in a small rural area, you're not going to probably find a practitioner just doing biofeedback. Yeah. But as the technology gets better, we are hoping to train like nurses and doctor's offices or social workers or other people to do it. And now this pandemic is forcing us to try to use uh, at a distance technology as well. And that may actually be good for the field. We might be able to get something in the hands of people so we can have our sessions with them online uh, for people, especially in inaccessible areas. Right now, it's everybody, but 
Uh, eventually, we'll get people back to the clinic, which we prefer. But uh, but we're using the technology to check on practice now, which we weren't doing before, and that's kind of yeah. So I think it's going to. Uh, I think it's you're seeing uh, uh, online uh, online buzz about, especially heart rate variability biofeedback is all over the place now. Uh, and the, big, the biggest segment are athletes who are using it to, to check their fitness. So if you, if you check your fitness level, if you do baseline levels every day, if you buy the equipment and do that, if your heart rate variability dips, it's usually a sign of overtraining. Mm, so some, of, some of the best football, soccer teams in the world are doing daily heart rate variability checks on their technique on that technique. Leo Messi is the probably best soccer and football player in the world for Barca. Uh, he his strength and fitness coach checks his heart rate variability every day. Mm, interesting. Uh, Trying to gear the training for it. So that and that of course is very sexy. So people are really interested. <laughs> so, you gotta get the celebrities into it and then people will pick it up. Right. Yeah. Um, well then what are another question that came up is do you have any tips for people that are just starting with biofeedback or, um, you know, what are some best metrics to measure your progress with biofeedback? That's a question we get a lot when people use Flowly. There's a couple of metrics that we were talking about earlier. Um, you can do, if you can get some equipment, like Flowly, Flowly equipment will allow you to do this, that the person has, you can get baseline levels. When that is your, your, your heart rate variability should be measured when you're breathing normally at normal situations just sitting there reading or something. That's the only valid measurement of, of your resting levels. So you can definitely see progress in that over weeks if you have equipment that'll do your resting levels. Quick note, we do do it. So people that are our pro subscribers, we actually measure your resting heart rate variability at the beginning of every session so that we can give you that data point. So that's a great point. Yeah, so you can. we have some published data showing dramatic changes in that resting level. <clears throat> so this is really not something you're doing during the time. You're just sitting quietly, but your autonomic nervous system is showing like a 25% more efficiency. It's really like getting a much better thermostat. Imagine that you've got a crappy thermostat so it gets way too warm before the AC goes on and way too uh, cold before the heat goes on. And you get a technician in to tune up that thermostat so it's very quickly switches back and forth mm. at comfortable temperatures all the time. That's what happens. And that shows up with one of these metrics that you guys use to, at the resting level. Um, we can also use a, another metric for practice because when you practice, what happens is the, the other metrics don't work anymore. But there is a couple of things you can look at, uh, some fancy ways of looking at the practice that show us if you're practicing effectively or not. And that, pra that progress usually comes pretty quickly. Within a week, you should see much better progress. And again, you guys are trying to put that in as your feedback. Yeah. People, sh people should be able to see that they're getting up to snuff pretty quickly. And once you hit that peak of that, though, then that's it. it the rest of your life, it'll always be the same for that particular one. But you'll see gains in heart rate variability resting levels over the course of weeks and months. Yeah, I know we talked about how like you you can only max out your HRV to a certain level, like we're not superhuman, but once you get to that max though, it still takes some work to maintain it from my understanding, right? right. It still requires practice. Correct. Last question is how can people take what they learn like in sessions, like in um, our platform or in other platforms like HeartMath, work with you, what are the best ways they can practice or implement it when they're not doing the biofeedback session? First thing is what we've already said, they have to overlearn it in practice. So they really got yeah. it, just like any other motor skill, right? So you can't, uh, you can't perform well on the golf course if you haven't practiced enough to get your swing down, right? So once you get the technique down, then you can use what we call rescue breathing techniques in, in the situations you're in. Um, and so most people don't do the, a dysfunctional thing. They, they uh, hyperventilate when they get anxious. They'll take very big, deep breaths, which works only for a few breaths, but after that, it makes you worse. Hmm. So we teach our folks to do everything from athletes to depressed people is when they're feeling their physiology acting up, 
use their resonance frequency breathing, even four or five slow diaphragmatic breaths. And they report to us that as time goes on, they get really good at that. Yeah. So they can take those a few breaths and, and use it in for performance, for um, like they're in a business meeting that is very stressful. Uh, nobody has to see you're doing it. You just sold slowly shift your, your me breath. every day, me every day. <laughs> so you do that in those kinds of situations, uh, and and the if you practice, it's quite an effective technique for doing it. I mean, we you and I so yeah. Some years ago, I had to get an MRI, and I didn't think I had any stress about that at all. But they put you in this machine with this thing right in your nose, banging yeah. away like crazy. And I realized this is actually kind of stressful. So I just went into my resonance frequency breathing and I almost fell asleep. No. I was able to stay still. I was able to really calm down my anxiety. They got a really nice, clear picture. Uh, <clears throat> so, I mean, I really, you know, I did practice what I preached, at least in that situation. Yeah. I always have to remind myself that I preach this and I talk about this all the time, but I need to have the discipline to do it as well. Thank you so much for being here, Richard, because... I think biofeedback is amazing in that you're using external tools, but really strengthening your internal resources. And it's kind of putting the power back in your own hands to um, control how you feel. And so I think it's incredible work. You've paved the path for so many people and teams like ours. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. Well, good, good work for you guys. I'm, I'm so happy to see it going. Yeah, thanks Richard. Mm -hmm.